I'm thankful to know the Lord. How about you? Amen. I don't really know how long this may not take very long, but <laughs> um, don't get mad at me. <laughs> um, it's just something that kind of like Matthew uh, had said Sunday morning, you know, God gives him one word. Sometimes that's what I get. <laughs> And I've had this word on my heart for a while. <clears throat> so, but full disclosure, for those of you that text me this morning, I already had this message, so don't think it's straight to you. <laughs> you know who you are. But God knows what he's doing. And I trust him. And I love him. And I love his ways. Because his ways are perfect. And he is, all he longs for, like we said earlier, is your love and devotion. And then, like I was saying last week, I think it was that not only has God made this perfect plan of salvation, Dad, but he's made it foolproof. Where if we'll just follow his instruction and do as he said, we can't, we'll never fall. That's what he says. You will not fall. But we've got to do what he says. And, but the, Jesus himself says, you know, the, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So we've got to, we're going to battle the flesh until our breath is taken or Jesus comes back. The spirit and the flesh are going to war against each other until we make it to heaven. Or I die, whichever comes first. <laughs> I really don't care. As long as Jesus is there, I want to make it, don't you? I just come from a funeral of, or, well, the visitation. He's not much older than my husband cancer we all have experienced the loss in here unexpected ones we don't I know it sounds cliche and we hear it so often that it just comes kind of numb we're numb to it tomorrow's not promised so it's imperative that we do what God says that we seek him first above everything else that we crucify this flesh and seek after him because he only wants your good. He wants to work everything out in your life for your good. He doesn't want you to be miserable. I don't think Jesus walked this earth and was miserable. I think he had peace and he had contentment. And he had joy because he had the Father. What do you have? The same thing. So where's your joy tonight? I oh, was dragging here. It's another Thursday night. I'm going to slip right in at 729. That way I don't have to be there any longer than I have to be. Do you think God's pleased? I mean, you, we, we don't say that, but we act like it. Our actions speak louder than our words. I love you, Lord. I don't want to go tonight. Just gonna sneak in. Maybe they won't notice I'm there. Maybe they won't ask me to do anything. That's not the message. Sorry, that was free, as Clyde would say. The word that's been on my mind, and I'm preaching to me as well, is repentance. Repentance. I was, um, well, I'm still reading this book by. Jim Simbala, who is the pastor of the Brooklyn Tabernacle in New York. And he, he's telling the story about how he took over the church when it was just a handful of people. And he and his wife were young. They had a young daughter at the time. And he talks about all the struggles they had. They're right in the inner city. So you can imagine in New York, in Brooklyn, New York, the amount of evil, drugs, prostitution, 
gangs, guns, violence, just, you know, on every corner. He, he even tells one story that a man come up the aisle with his gun pointing at him. But he was so in, in the spirit preaching, he had his eyes closed. He didn't know it, but he was told later. The guy come right up to him and held his gun at his chest, and then he dropped it, and he fell weeping at the altar. The power of God to change people, and that's what I've been talking about. And that is what true repentance is. It will change you. A true experience with God will change your life. And I'm not just talking, I'm not talking to just backsliders or sinners. I'm talking about us so-called saints who got it all going on and we just know how it's done. Maybe we don't. Because where's the signs? And I'm not saying there's not any here. There have been. There's people being saved and healed. And Tyler, thank God for it moving in that. And others, Craig. You, t- you look at your own life. Don't look at anybody else. Don't look at your neighbor. Don't, don't think about anybody else and try to judge them and size them up because that's not what we're here for. You got to take care of you. And I got to take care of me. And it's about prayer. To get back to this story of Jim Cimbala and the, the Brooklyn Tabernacle, the reason he says it has grown to nearly 10,000 members and several um, locations and they founded other churches is because of their great worship team, his great preaching, his dynamic word. No. Prayer. To this day, from the time that they started to this day, they meet every Tuesday night and they have prayer meeting. Nothing but prayer. And seeking the face of God for the lost for what and other other needs and he testifies of several miracles that have happened and conversions that have happened in those people's lives but that's what's been on my heart i want to get back to true repentance and i was thinking about there are several scriptures but first go with me to second corinthians chapter 7 You can read this whole chapter, but um, I want to focus on verse 10. Paul writes, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Godly sorrow works repentance, true repentance. And to repent means that you turn away from, and you don't go there, you don't do that anymore. But if you just have worldly sorrow, and again, I'm not throwing it at anybody. This was all together before I talked to anybody. God knows what he's doing. But worldly sorrow is, I'm, I'm just caring about what Nikki thinks of me and my mistakes. All I care about is what everybody, the church thinks of me and what I've done wrong. And I, I can weep and cry over that, but that's not going to fix anything. That's not going to change my life, my habits. It takes that godly... It, and godly sorrow is this, in my opinion. You can, you can ask other people, but from what I've read and understand and talked to God about, godly sorrow is when I grieve for what I've done to Him. Not that I'm grieving because I've made a mess of my life or I've done something stupid and, and everybody's going to shame me or everybody's going to look down on me. That's worldly sorrow. And that brings death. Nothing comes of it. Just dies when you go right back. But godly sorrow. Godly sorrow is... I, It don't matter what people think about me. I've wronged God. The very one who died to save me, 
I've sinned against him. And I'm not talking about great big sins. I'm talking about in our daily life. Does it, does it bother you if thoughts kill me? That's where I struggle. You know, thoughts come through and I'm like, wait a minute. That ain't, that ain't right. But if you let them linger and you start thinking on things that you shouldn't, have you repented of those? I'm not talking about going out and, I don't know, committing adultery or murdering somebody. It's the little things. It's the small foxes that spoil the vine. And I'm here to tell you, if you want to carry the power of a living God, then you've got to come holy. I've got to come holy. If we want to carry the power of an almighty living God, we've got to walk holy. I know that sounds harsh, but it's the truth. And I'm talking to myself just as much as you because my prayer life's got to come up. My prayer life's got to come up higher. We can always do better. And there's always a deeper depth and a higher height that he wants to take us to. But we're so busy pleasing this flesh. But who's your number one? We say God's number one, and I'm right here. I'm, I'm talking to myself. We say God's number one, but that alarm clock goes off. Snooze. <laughs> Snooze again about three times, and it's three hours later, and I'm still laying there. It's summer, God. I just want to sleep in. I don't have to run people anywhere. I just want to sleep in. That's no excuse. Just because school's out doesn't mean the demons quit working. Really? I mean, seriously? They don't get a summer break, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure they don't get summer vacation. So I've got to be on my game no matter when. And, and, and I, I struggle. Y'all pray for me. I struggle with laziness. Summertime, I just want Because, you know, you go through that routine of... Getting up every morning, making lunches, making snacks. Make, well, I don't do much breakfast anymore. They don't eat breakfast, but they're out the, we go out the door, get them to school. I come home, I do work at the shop, I pay bills and blah, 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 blah. Do housework, get groceries, you know. And before you know it, your day's gone. I'm tired. But like my husband has said, you do what you want to do. So if I really want to spend that, and I, you know, you want to spend that time in his presence, you'll, you'll make an effort. You'll make an effort. So pray for me. I'm not perfect. I'm not where I want to be. I, but I, I'm, I'm trying my best to, I want to grow. Don't you want to grow? Amen. And get closer to him because as big as he is, <laughs> you'll never find the end of him. And what does he promise you? Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. When are we going to get it? <laughs> but so often, and I was thinking about this when Arnold was pre I think it was Arnold preaching Sunday night, May or somebody, I don't remember. My nights, I don't know what day it is. At any rate, I think it was him, and, and the thought come to me, oh, he was talking about Moses. Yeah, it was, Arnold. And how Moses, because he, he struck the rock, not once, but twice, when God told him to simply speak to it, all because of that misstep, he didn't get to go into the land of Canaan. He had to stand on the hill and look over, and he could see what it looked like, but he didn't get to go in. Do you think you're greater than Moses? He, he talked to God. He was on the mountain for 40 days talking to God and then comes down, sees the finger of God, write the commandments. My goodness. I've often prayed, God, hide me in the cleft of the rock. I want to see your finger. I wonder if I'd come out with white hair. You know, they say Moses came down with a glow about him because here's the thing. When you are truly in the presence of God, you'll look different. There'll be a glow about you. 
And I want that. Don't you? We've got to do better. Prioritizing God, putting him first. And praying with a repentant heart, a truly repentant heart that you have done him wrong. Even the littlest slip up. God, I'm sorry. I, I, I said that before I even thought. And I, I'm, I wronged you and I'm sorry. Not that, oh God, I made a fool of myself. Who cares what anybody else thinks? You better be caring what God thinks. And only godly sorrow brings true repentance. Otherwise, worldly sorrow is just going to bring about the same old thing, death, that you've been walking around in anyway. So when you're concerned about him and his feelings, which is what we all should be, you're going to have a different, different attitude. I want to please him. And when I fail him, it hurts. I'm like, God, I've been serving you for however many years and I did that. I'm sorry. I should know better. You know? But there is something to this. You want true repentance. You want true to truly turn from where you're at. Godly sorrow. Think about how it wrongs him. Not how everybody, it's all, your life is a mess or, or blaming everybody else for this or that. But think about what, it done, what you've done to him. He gave the very best for each and every one of us and we have all fallen short. We have all fallen short. But thanks be to God. The Bible says if I confess my sins, He's faithful to forgive me, Dad. Go with me to Psalms 51. I often prayed part of this psalm when I was a younger Christian. Created me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit within me and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Amen. This was a psalm of David, you see, after he had done what he did with Bathsheba. We all know that story. And then had a man killed. My goodness. I've never done that. Have you? But Moses struck a rock. So sin is sin is my point. Before a holy God, it doesn't matter if you've murdered or if you've just simply disobeyed. Sin is sin. Because he is holy, Dad. We forget that he is a perfectly holy and just God. And he desires to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. No falsehoods. No fakes. Don't, don't bring any fakeness to him. He wants you to worship him in spirit and in truth. Psalm 51, I wanted to look at verse 16. I'll get there in a second. I thought I was there and I got sidetracked. <laughs> For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, thou wilt not despise. God won't despise your broken and contrite heart. That means you're sorrowful for what you've done wrong. But you're sor David was sorrowful how he'd sinned against God. He wasn't off hiding somewhere, you know, oh, the, the people are going to kill me. No. He was ashamed before God Almighty that he'd shamed him and he'd wronged him and he'd disobeyed him. And that was a broken and contrite spirit and God will not despise it. That is godly sorrow. And the one thing that God desires more than any other is for us to have brokenness over our sin. Amen. That we take it seriously. I know where I kind of left my thought of Moses earlier. Um, that we think that, you know, that may not look like a big sin. He struck the rock. Well, so what? 
But to God, that represented Jesus Christ. And he simply didn't do what God told him to do. God said, speak to it, and he smacked it. So here's Moses, the prophet, the one who stood on the mountain with God. And then he, because he disobeys, he didn't hurt anybody. He was angry at the people, and who could blame him? The, there, are, there were millions of people with him. And all of them were saying, well, you, you let us out here to die. We had it better in Egypt. Well, I'd get mad too. I'd almost throw that staff at them and say, well, you lead yourself to the promised land. I'll see you later. I'm going back to Egypt. I'm a son of Egypt. Seriously, he was a son of Egypt. He could have stayed where he was at in the, uh, the nice palace where he was at and all the Hebrew slaves waiting on him. But he chose to do, when he found out who he really was, he chose to obey God. But the point is, is his sin, there was consequences. That's the point I'm trying to get to. There were consequences for his sin. And his price was he couldn't go into the land of Canaan. And I was thinking about it when Arnold was preaching that the other night, that we take it so lightly. I've always been taught to take it seriously. But as we get older, you know how you, it's kind of like that first child, you're so, oh, watch out, be careful. The second one comes along, you're like, oh, they'll be all right. <laughs> That's kind of how we get comfortable with God. Oh, he'll look, he loves me. He'll look over this. He knows I didn't mean it. But there are consequences for our sin. That's what, that's what keeps me from sinning. Is not only that I would hurt God, but that there will be consequences. Even when you get forgiveness, there will be consequences. Because the Bible says, what you, re- what you sow, therefore shall you reap. You sow in wickedness, you'll reap wickedness. You sow in righteousness, you'll reap righteousness. That's the word of God. It, it, you know, people out here today, they want to make up things and make up words and make up genders and make up their own truth. They can make up all they want, but it doesn't change the real truth that what God says goes. And when you sin, if you want repentance, you need to have that godly sorrow. You need to think about how it affects him, not about how everybody else looks at you. That's prideful. That's that flesh being, I'm ashamed of what I've done. Well, you should be. We all should be. When we sin, we should be ashamed. But that shouldn't be the reason that we come and give our hearts back to God. We should say, God, I've wronged you, and I am sorry. And until you get to that point in your heart, you won't find repentance. Any of us. And as Christians, we take it so lightly. We think that I've been born again, I'm good. Well, yeah, but you've been given that robe of righteousness that's your responsibility to keep it clean. And you're going to be battled by the flesh and by the enemy until you depart this life and you it's on you to keep it clean. And it's not hard. We've been given the instructions. But it's going to take a little effort. We got to get up and work a little bit. But anything worth having is worth working for. And I'm not saying you have to work for your salvation to work it out. That's not what I'm saying. Jesus finished it. But you got to keep that robe clean. And you got to do the work. He said to keep my commandments. He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So that's not work. I love him. I want to be in his presence. I want to love other people. I want to help other people. I want other I want all of you to prosper. And not just I'm not talking just money. Your soul, I want your soul to prosper. I want you to fall in love with Jesus so deep that you can't see straight. Amen. And I want you to be out here affecting other people's lives because that's what God is that's why he saved you. Amen. To have that exponential effect that I can touch Jesse, but then Jesse can go out and influence Christine and three others that she's around that I never see. Do you see the the point here? You're to be little Jesuses. 
But how can we be if we've got unrepentant sin and things in our lives that we think, oh, nobody knows about that. Well, God knows everything. God knows everything. But the godly sorrow that works repentance, that will lead you to life and freedom and joy. Don't you? you, Our lives are short when you think about it. Don't you want to have a joyful existence? I do. I don't want to be dreary and humdrum and and hateful. And I don't want to be around that. And I don't want to be, I don't want to give off that vibe either. I want people to say, oh, here comes Amy. She's so fun. She loves everybody. They probably don't say that, but you know, I'm trying. I'm a work in progress. I want to be better tomorrow than I was yesterday. I want us to keep growing and learning of who Jesus is and how he would handle situations. And you know what? I was thinking about it. He prayed a lot. I got to I got to go more. I got to I got to stay in the Father's presence more. And but this word repentance it was just so it, it stuck with me for a couple of weeks actually. And I was just like, God, whatever you want, say it. But so often we feign repentance. And and I'm talking to Christians, you know, we Oh, God, I'm sorry. Are you really? I can say I'm sorry and not really mean it. Y'all have experienced people. You know how your kids fight and argue and you tell them you're sorry. I'm sorry. Are they really? (laughs) God knows. God knows your heart. Just be honest with him. God, help my heart to long for you more than anything of this world because nothing of this world is going to satisfy me but you. And Satan just comes along and he throws everything at people. He knows your weaknesses. He's no dummy. He, He knows what your weaknesses are. He knows your past. He knows what things you struggle with. And he's going to keep throwing things at you. But as long as you're running from God, he's going to get you. Satan's going to get you. You keep running from God and Satan's going to get you. And I don't want anybody. You you don't have to go there. You don't have to experience that. You don't have to live a miserable life. That's not what God intended. You're his child and, and like any good father, he wants to give you good things, but you won't let him. Because there's a catch. In order to get those good things, I got to keep his word. I got to obey. Like any good father, he's not going to reward the unruly child who won't do what he asks. Is he? He's going to love them. He's going to keep loving them, but he's going to discipline them. And he's going to chide with them for a while. But please don't push the hand of God to the point that there is no more mercy. Because I know for a fact that he says he won't always strive with man. And he's God. Who am I to say, you know, if I messed up tomorrow, Jesse, that and ask him, God, please forgive me. What if he says, no, I'm done with you. I've had 40 years of your nonsense. I'm done. He's God. What can I say? I don't want to push his hand. Because he's a holy and a just God. Righteous judgment. It means that when you stand before his throne, you're going to get the the judgment that you deserve, that you rightly deserve. There'll be no falsehood about it. There'll be no faking it. There'll be no smoothing it over. It's going to be straight on and I want him to see the blood of Jesus and my clean robe that I've done my best to keep under the blood until he called me home does that make sense be careful as God is calling his church 
to a deepness. He wants to reveal things. He says in Jeremiah, he says, seek me with all your heart and I'll show you things that you didn't know. That excites me. I want to I want to experience that, don't you? And but he's calling his church to prayer. Which is relationship with him. But see it's one on one. I can pray all day for Jesse. But if she's not willing to spend some time with God and read his word, then it's not my it's not going to do any good. She's got to make that effort on her own. Because I won't be standing there with her before the throne. Every one of us are going to stand and give account of our own lives. And I want to say, God, I did the best I could to please you and keep your word. Because I love Jesus. And I love you. And I wanted to make you happy. And I hope I did. So that's why I'm standing up here telling, I don't want to be up here. Y'all know that. (laughs) I'd rather be sitting back there where Dave's at. But I got to tell you, godly sorrow works repentance. If you truly want to change in your life, even even us that, you know, come to church every every night. If you want that you want that stir and that change, make an effort. Think about his feelings for a change. Think about how we've wronged him. How we've shamed him. Because godly sorrow works repentance. I hope this makes sense. Go with me. I got one more scripture in Hosea. I meant to mark it because I never can find it. It's right in one of the minor prophets here. There it is. Hosea chapter 10. I always love this verse. Hosea 10, verse 12. Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy. What is righteousness? Right living. Right standing with God. That tells me that if I'm making an effort, Dad, to stand to live righteously, to keep his commandments, that I'm going to find mercy when I stumble. Amen. Yeah. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Are we seeking the Lord? Truly hard after him, just running after him, seeking to know what his heart wants for us? Or is it just like, oh Lord, bless my family, keep them safe, bring us all back together safe, amen, thank you. I hope your relationship is deeper than that with the Lord. That you tell him everything. That you talk to him constantly because he wants to hear from you. He desires to hear from you. Don't just feign repentance. But think about how you've wronged him. I've I've been examining my own self. Where am I coming up short, Lord? Why? I want to see more good things. You know, proof of my prayers coming about. I want to see it. And I've had to examine me. We all have to examine our own heart, search your own heart, and lay it bare before God Almighty. And you watch and see if he doesn't scoop you up in his big old arms and say, come on, child, I knew you were coming. We got it. We can make this better, but you got to do my way. You got to go my way. You got to go God's way. My way is not going to work. He desires to rain righteousness upon you. Good things. Blessings. He desires to bless his children. 
but we're not ready to receive because we're out here trying to do our own thing. But come, lay your heart bare before him and ask him to forgive you of everything you've ever done. And watch what he does. He can change your life. He can do just like that song Nikki sang tonight. He can make it all new. That's what he, he loves to do that. He is a good father. Let's all stand tonight as we have an altar call. Lay your heart bare before God Almighty. Amen. Keep nothing back because he knows it anyway. Confess it all. And, and you know, the thing is, is this isn't just a one-time thing. It's an attitude of the heart that we need to keep before God. To know that he, if he so chooses, Jesse, he could just say, I'm done with you. And he don't have to have a reason. I trust in his goodness and his mercy and the fact that he's love. But I don't want to take advantage of that. He's also mighty and powerful. And nobody can, nobody, who counsels God? Were you there? I like when he tells Job, were you there? No. When he hung the stars and the moon, were you there? Did you counsel him and say, a little to the left on that one, Lord. A little to the right. Oh, I wouldn't call it that. That name sounds cheesy. No. The great God of heaven who created everything you can see created you. And he made you for relationship with him. For his pleasure. His goodwill and his pleasure. Come, the altar's open. Give everything you've got to him because you won't regret it. When you truly repent to my father and lay everything bare, he'll make all things new. Amen. Let's pray.